It's been an honor to spend the last four years helping President Obama advance renewable energy in the United States. It's an integral tool in the fight to address climate change. And if you'll let me brag for just a few minutes, I have a point. Um, I can say with certainty that we made great progress. We catalyzed breakthrough research, we published plans and set targets, we built coalitions and partnerships with countries, states, the private sector, civil society, we provided financial support when necessary, and we got results. President Obama showed the world that the United States was serious about developing a thriving renewable energy economy and ensuring that every American was able to participate. During his time in office, the cost of wind and solar technologies dropped 40%. Wind generation grew threefold. Solar generation grew more than 50-fold. In fact, solar development in the United States last year alone grew 95%. And we had record growth in jobs for renewable energy. And most importantly, we debunked the claim that by climate deniers that taking action to address climate change would put a drag on the economy. In fact, from 2008 to 2015, carbon emissions from the energy sector decreased 9.5% while the economy grew 10%. And of course, we built coalitions to ensure the Paris Agreement entered into force last year. In eight years, we helped catalyze the transition from fossil fuels to cleaner sources of energy, a transition that, as Nikki said, is inevitable. And this is progress that cannot be unraveled, which brings me to why we're here today. So one thread that was important to President Obama was expanding consumer choice and ensuring that every American had an opportunity to participate in the clean energy economy, in particular, low and moderate income communities. This was challenging because in the United States, nearly half of all households and businesses are currently unable to generate electricity from rooftop solar systems because they either don't own a building or they lack sufficient roof space or their, their, high, their credit score just isn't high enough. Um, uh, and this barrier was a particular concern for low-income households since energy remains one of their um, predominant costs. In fact, uh, in the US, low and moderate income households represent 40% of the population, but only 5% of solar customers. So we put our heads together and we identified a solution, community solar. How many people here know what community solar is? Raise your hand. OK, so fair amount. Um, for those that don't, uh, community solar is a way that uh, residents, businesses share electricity from one central solar array. In practice, that mean, this means that households, businesses, churches can join together to invest in one solar energy system at a lower cost. Reducing the financial barriers of the initial investment, freeing up capital, and driving community economic development. For low-income populations, the savings can make the difference of whether you can stay in your neighborhood or you have to move. And the potential is vast. In the US, our Department of Energy estimates that community solar can make up to 50% of the solar market by 2020 and worth about $16 billion in investment. So that's real dollars for us. Um, and what's interesting from a policy and a political perspective is that community solar is a bottom-up solution to a transition to cleaner energy sources. Um, it augmented a more federal-centric plan that the president put together, uh, our climate action plan, um, where we took more of a top-down approach, where community solar, on the other hand, is a policy that we at the White House and that the agencies could support um, by building partnerships and networks, and it'd be up to the states and communities to do the hard work. But if it was successful in the long term, we knew that community solar would provide a way for states and utilities to meet some of the larger federal renewable energy targets we had, um, and comply with some of our regulations without federal support. So it was a really important policy choice. And politically, um, it appeared to be a bipartisan approach to clean energy development. Both Democrat and Republican states had laws in the books and a process to enable the use of community solar. And some of the players in rural areas that were opposed to some of our traditional regulatory approaches um, were supporters of community solar. So what, we, what did we do uh, to get this market off the ground? Five things, and I'll try to be brief. First. We listened. We brought together a range of partners, including businesses, utility companies, governments, nonprofits, financial institutions, universities, red states, blue states, people that could mutually benefit from community solar. We brought them together in a workshop that's much like one of the workshops that you'll be in for the next two days. And we listened to what role the federal government could play in scaling up community solar. Second, we met people where they were. I remember going over to our Department of Energy, normal political hack, um, sat, sat down with uh, the team and started spouting off ideas about how we could create these really robust, innovative community solar programs across the country. Um, they let me finish and they looked me in the eye and they said, Candace, we can't do any of that. Um, and I said, 
okay, and they said we need to create a knowledge base, we need to build awareness, we need to, um, we need to meet people where they are. And the team was right. So thirdly, we focused on building a network of lasting partnerships. And in 2010, 2000, excuse me, 15, the White House, in collaboration with our energy, housing, agriculture, and environmental agencies, announced a national community solar partnership. We reached out to market participants across the country and asked them to join. And fourth, when we called them, which is really important, um, we made hard asks. So we didn't just ask the organizations to join the partnerships. We asked them to make a financial commitment or a commitment to develop a certain amount of community solar uh, or to create a new policy in their state that would enable the development of community solar. And we aggregated the members' commitments, we published the commitments, and um, we kept building awareness, we kept calling, we kept publishing. Uh, one of the things I learned in the White House was how um, just asking people to do things and putting them all together and showing people how much momentum you can build was incredibly important in terms of policy development. And lastly, we provided resources and incentivized the creation of local networks. We released guides for states on best practices. We invited community development organizations and finance institutions to the White House to ensure they knew about the opportunity of community solar and how to overcome any barriers and to lock in progress and to provide a mechanism for communities to build local networks. At the end of the year, last year, the Department of Energy launched a national solar in your community competition. So this is a competition that'll provide up to $10,000 to teams across the country, which, will, which create innovative business models for community solar. Um, so for this one, it's not about the money as much as about creating teams in your local area with partners that you wouldn't normally work with. And the results speak for themselves. In total, since 2015, we attracted 155 organizations representing 36 states to join our community solar partnership. The initial set of announcements from states, businesses, community organizations committed, uh, they committed more than $400 million in community solar and put in place more than 200 community solar projects. The following year, the members committed to deploy 145 megawatts of community solar. Um, and that was all within low and moderate income areas. And between 2015 and 2016, this nascent market quadrupled from 52 megawatts of installations to 218. And we already have 230 projects uh, operating with about 200, two, excuse me, 2,090 in the pipeline. So it's growing and it's growing really fast. Um, but I have to tell you, the most inspiring part of this work was the people. On one of our last meetings in the White House before the administration changed, um, we met with a group of pastors and community organizers. They came in to thank us for community solar, for making community solar a priority and to share their progress. And it was remarkable. Their 15,000 member interdenominational church located in one of DC's hardest areas um, was just partnered with a local nonprofit to announce that they were building the largest community solar array in DC. And this would provide uh, solar for about 150 residents. And what was interesting about this project is that in addition to the 10% lower cost that uh, community solar would provide for the residents, they also, for every two members uh, that, would, that signed up for community solar, they were going to give, uh, provide solar to the third, a third household for no cost, saving that low-income family up to $600. Um, and the project, as the pastor said, can be replicated across the country to give communities that are left out of the clean and affordable energy conversation ownership of their energy future. And they're not the only ones. Churches from all over the country are starting to turn to community solar, and many other players are as well. And they're going all in on community solar. Last year, one of the largest, uh, the country's largest rural electric cooperatives, which is located in Texas, partnered with a local energy company and announced they're installing up to 15 megawatts of community solar in the area. And there are dozens of other rural electric co-ops across the country who are doing this as well. Even Fortune 500 country, companies excuse me, uh, and financial institutions are getting involved um, because it provides another tool to help them save money, to promote economic development, and, and serve the local community. And I'd also like to add that solar, community solar can also make, um, make uh, communities more resilient and provide power that is reliable. So last year, the state of Hawaii adopted a policy to incentivize pairing community solar with storage um, to, to help uh, create uh, the momentum in the state and make it a more lasting and reliable solution. And cities are using community solar increasingly to increase, to create microgrids, to create critical infrastructure, um, uh, to provide power for critical infrastructure during power outages. So what does all of this mean um, for the folks in this room today? In an uncertain political climate, we must do thing, to just do two things. First, we must turn to what we know works. And second, 
we must implement what we know will be lasting. So Community Solar achieves both of these goals and more. It not only provides a grassroots solution to solve our climate problem, but it also makes renewable, the renewable energy market more equitable, as Nikki said earlier, by providing low-income households a way to participate. It's working in the US, and based on the progress that we've already seen in Australia and the energy in this room today, I know it can be a success here too. So I hope you'll make the most of this conference. It was a gathering much smaller than the one here today that helped us to create a renewable energy market in the US. And I would like to come back here in two or three years and hear about how you've advanced community solar in Australia at half the time it took us in the US. So one thing I didn't mention that we also did was set a, a target. We love targets in the US, um, especially we love them in the Obama White House. Um, and one of the targets we set was to install one gigawatt of low income solar by 2020. Um, so I'd like to ask this group today, or over the next two days, as you're thinking through um, what you all can do, what would that target be for Australia? It's my understanding that there are, correct me if I'm wrong here, but that there are about 50 community energy projects in Australia right now. So what's a realistic target for you guys to set for yourself um, for the next two years or for 2020 in terms of how many community energy projects that you'd like to see? Um, we quadrupled the number of megawatts of uh, community solar in a year. Could you guys quadruple it in the number of community energy projects in two years? Um, uh, what do people think? How many? 50 to what? <laughs> in one year? <laughs> to, to what number? Come on. 200 in two years? All right, what do people think? Is that realistic? Yeah. Okay. All right. We'll think about it. And um, uh, I hope by the end of the conference, you guys have, have uh, agreed in whether that's, that's the right target or not. But um, again, thank you for letting me be here today and uh, sharing the perspective from the US.